The story is told of a famous chess champion who was on vacation in Europe. And he loved art, so he decided while on vacation he would visit a number of art galleries in Europe. He came to one particular art gallery and began to peruse it and ran across a painting that both mesmerized and stupefied him. It was a painting of a chess game in progress. On one side of the chess board was a painting of the devil. And the devil was laughing and full of joy and gaiety and hilarity rocking back in his chair just just in great joy. On the other side of the chessboard was a young man terrified. Tears were running down his face, sweat pouring down his forehead. He was biting his nails in fear. It became clear what the painting was all about when the chess champion read above the painting the title. It was simply called Checkmate. The devil was about to make the final move to win this young man's soul. He was hilarious and the young man was terrified. Well, the chess champion thought this was an intriguing picture. But then he got really interested in it and he stared at it for a long time. Actually, hours he stared at it. After a number of hours staring at the painting, the chess champion began to smile. He found the proprietor of the gallery and said, sir, would you happen to have a chess board here? They looked around and they found a chess board and he laid the chess board out at the base of the painting precisely as they were in the painting itself. He looked down at his own chess board, then he looked up at the painting. He looked down at his own chess board, then he looked up at the painting. He looked down at his own chess board. He looked back up at the painting and then he began to laugh. He turned to the picture of the young man and said, Mr. I sure wish you could hear me now because I got good news. It only looks like the devil's winning because there is still one move left on the board and you get to make it. Your enemy has miscalculated something. I'm a chess champion and I know this game. I got some good news. You can wipe that sweat off your forehead, dry your weeping eyes, and take your fingers out of your mouth because you, not he, gets to make the final move. A lot of us have been duped in the thinking that the devil is winning. We've been duped in the thinking that he and not us get to make the final move. We've been duped in the thinking he's running the show, calling the shots, and we are puppets on his string. We've been duped into thinking that he is the final decision maker about our joy, our happiness, our well-being, our spirituality, and all the other elements that make life work because he seems to be running the show. Well, I came to you with some good news today. Wipe the sweat off your forehead, dry your weeping eyes, and take those jittering uh, fingers out of your clashing teeth. Because you, not he, gets to make the final move. Now to understand that, you have to understand the history of the conflict that we call spiritual warfare. You see, God made the first move when he created angels. Lucifer reacted negatively to that move and rebelled against God. Took one third of the angels with him. God countered that move by creating man in his own image a little lower than the angels. Satan rebelled against that move by getting Adam and Eve to turn the earth over to his control. But God countered that move by providing a redemptive covering for Adam and Eve so that they could return back to fellowship with God. Of course, Satan tried to counter that move by getting Cain to kill Abel in order to cut off the godly line. Well, that's when God counted that move through the birth of Seth so that men began to call on the name of the Lord again. Of course, that's when Satan tried to counter that move through the birth of Nimrod, who built the civilizations of Babylon and Assyria. They gathered at the Tower of Babel to build a religion in defiance of God. Of course, that's when God counted that move by going to the heir of the Chaldees, finding a man named Abraham and saying, I'm going to create my own nation that will obey. 
course, that's when Satan countered that move by getting them trapped in the Egypt so that Pharaoh would not let them go. But then God countered that move by going to Moses in Midian and telling him uh, to go tell Pharaoh, I said, let my people go. And the whole Old Testament is move, counter, move, move, counter, move, move, counter, move, move, counter, move. And we're not sure who went in this game. You come to the end of the Old Testament, there are 400 silent years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Both sides are just staring at the board. But when the New Testament opens up, so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so, then you get to Matthew chapter 1 verse 16, who begot Joseph who was married to Mary by whom was born Jesus Christ. Up until this time, God would find a man and use a man. When the New Testament opens up, God says, I'm tired of this mess. Let me come on down here and take care of this mama myself. So God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. Satan tried to counter that move by tempting him in uh, the wilderness. Jesus overcame that through the use of the word of God. And then he made his final move by getting Jesus Christ nailed to a cross to forever get rid of this agent of God. But that's when God made the final move. Because early on Easter Sunday morning, a little while before day, the grave was open. Jesus Christ arose and the final move was made. The move he didn't bank on. And that move is your move. No matter what's going on in your world, that move, that move, the accomplishment of the cross and the resurrection was God's final move that is your move for victory. Now, I don't know what's going on in your world, your life, your struggles, your mind. No matter what it is, I'm going to share with you today and throughout this series how you use the final move. In the passage that we are introducing this with today, finally, brethren, chapter 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord. And the strength of his might put on the, here's our series, the full armor of God. So that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Here it is. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers and world forces of this darkness. Against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. People are not your problem. Now, I know you think they're your problem because they're what you see, feel, touch, taste, and hear. But according to verse 12, whatever is going wrong in your world, people are merely the conduit for the root. They're the fruit. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The battles we have in life, whatever they may be, are not fundamentally physical in nature, flesh and blood. He says our battle is against principalities and, and powers and world forces of this darkness located in heavenly places. The word heavenly places means the spiritual realm. Whatever is going on in your world, your life has gone on, is going on, or will go on is rooted first in the spiritual realm heavenly places if you don't know how to navigate that realm you can't fix this realm spiritual warfare can simply be defined as the conflict in the invisible realm that affects what you're going through in the visible realm it is the battle in the unseen that is responsible for the battles in the scene Whatever is happening in the world of your five senses, flesh and blood, it has been created in a world you can't see. But if you can't navigate that world, you can't fix this world. Most of our attempts to fix this world is through using this world. But this world, flesh and blood, is not where the battle emanates from. Our battle is in an unseen realm called heavenly places. He uses this phrase uniquely in Ephesians to describe all of the Christian's activities. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, he says your blessings are located in heavenly places. 
Everything God is ever going to do for you is located in the unseen realm. Everything God is ever going to promise, fulfill, everything that you will ever need that will ever come your way has already been deposited in your account in the unseen realm, the heavenly places. He goes on later in chapter 1 and he goes on and he says about Jesus Christ, he says in chapter 1 verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. He says your blessings are in heavenly places and the one who's in charge, Jesus, is seated, having risen from the dead in heavenly places. So if you want to get to Jesus, you got to get to where he is. And where he is, is in the spiritual realm, heavenly places. Chapter 2, verse 6, he says, and we were raised with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He says, your blessings are in heavenly places. Jesus is seated in heavenly places. We are seated with him in heavenly places. So where you're physically seated is not the only place you're located. You're equally located in another realm, he says, that is heavenly places or the spiritual realm. Chapter 3, verse 10. He says, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. He says that the angels are in heavenly places. Now, you need to understand, you need your angel. Every Christian in here has at least one angel that has been assigned to you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.14 that angels are assigned to believers as ministering spirits. You have at least one angel who's assigned to you to operate on your behalf in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, you have somebody who knows that realm better than you, whose job it is to operate in that realm on behalf of you. So your blessings are in heavenly places. Jesus is seated in heavenly places. You are seated with him in heavenly places. Your angelic assistance is located in heavenly places. And then in chapter 6, verse 12, the principalities and the powers of darkness are located in heavenly places. So every Christian in here has a demon assigned to you. The demon is assigned to you and his job is to make hell break loose in your life. His job is to make sure that Satan has his way with you. There is a demon assigned to you by the devil whose job it is to watch your tape. See, in football, what they do is they watch tape to find the weaknesses in the other team. They constantly look at tape because they want to exploit the weaknesses. So the demonic realm knows your weak spots. He knows what happened when you were a child that messed up your thinking, that lowered your self-esteem. He knows about the sin patterns that have developed over your life, which invite demonic presence in them. They know about the issues, the abuses to you or from you that are operating within your world. And they have a job, one job, and that is to exploit your game film. They look at your game film, identify the weaknesses, and they are principalities and powers that are located in the spiritual realm. Okay, let's review. Your blessings are there. Christ is there. You are there. The angels are there. The demons are there. It seems like to me, what's happening is there. What's happening is there. The problem is it gets manifested here. All the physical world does is manifest what's happening in the spiritual world. If you are unaware of that world and you are unaware of how that world works, then all you are left is with the physical but the problem is the physical can't fix the physical if the problem that started from is in the spiritual. So we spend all of our time, money, effort, strength, mindsets, relationships to help us do better in the physical when that's not where the problem emanated from. It emanated from a location called heavenly places. So if you want to fix what started in the spiritual that's messing you up in the physical, you got to go back to the spiritual, which is the location of its origin. Now, what the demonic world doesn't want you to know is they don't want you to know that. They want you to live in the world of the five senses. The Bible calls that the natural man. He wants you to live in the world of the seeing and the touching and the tasting and the hearing and the smelling. He wants you to 
function by five senses. He wants you to fix you using the five senses or talk to other people with five senses like you who can help fix you. Only to discover all we're doing is picking fruit and not adjusting root. We're not getting to the origin of the problem. And because we're not getting, see, if all you see is what you see, then you do not see all there is to be seen. If all you see is what you see, then you do not see all there is to be seen. It is the invisible that affects the visible. So if you want to fix the visible and physical, you must address the invisible and spiritual. Failure to address the invisible spiritual cause has led to most, much, and in many cases all of the inability to have physical, visible cure. Because we haven't gotten to the cause, we can't come up with the cure. He says that we're in a wrestle. We're in a battle. This battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers that want to rob us of all that God has stored up for us in the spiritual realm. He says, he wants you to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Watch this now, watch this. The strategy of the devil. Let me tell you what devils and demons don't want you to know. They don't want you to know their methodology schemes because if you ever figure them out you got them so they don't want you to figure them out the devil wants you to think of him with horns a pitchfork and a red jumpsuit because if he got you thinking that way about him and you never see any horns pitchfork and a red jumpsuit you don't have to take him seriously he does not want you to figure him out the word schemes means deceptive strategies. Deceptive strategies. Satan's one overarching, he does it in many ways, but his one overarching principle is to deceive, trick, bamboozle. He operates by, he is the ultimate magician. He operates by sleight of hand. The Bible says that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, he came into a serpent, a snake. Why did he come into a snake? It says because the snake was the most crafty of animals, in this case a reptile, that God had created. So guess what? He found the appropriate vehicle in order to slither into the garden in order to deceive Adam and Eve. Now let me tell you why he did that. I don't want you to miss this. In order for the devil to be a good devil, and in order for demons to be good demons, they need a body through which to work. See, your problem is not the invisible spiritual realm. Your problem is the vehicle it uses to get to you, including you. It needs a vehicle. Satan had to have a vehicle, a physical vehicle, the serpent, in order to get to Adam and Eve. The Bible talks about uh, the angel working through people as angels of light, looking like the real deal, but trickery and deception. And let me explain this. This is the principle that I don't want you to miss. His scheme is to trick you. He doesn't want you to see him for what he really is, so he comes looking like something else. In order to get you to move away, watch this, from the protective covering of God. Now, I'm going to get to that in a moment. He knows as long as you are undercover, as long as you're under the protective covering of God, he can't get you. So he's got to get you to relocate. So what he does is he tricks you into a relocation. If he can get you to relocate, he's got you because you're no longer under protective covering. Okay? So he tricks you to remove you like he removed Adam and Eve from the protective covering of God so that he could get them to move and to turn over their world to him. So he is the ultimate trap. He is the ultimate deceiver. His schemes are designed to trick you and trap you into seeing things from his perspective. 
I remember a um, TV show that I used to like to look at. It comes on occasionally now, and you've all probably seen episodes from it. The Outer Limits, sci-fi. And on this one particular occasion, this particular uh, fleet, one of the ships uh, crashed, and it was captured in this alien environment. And this alien, this scaled creature, took this human and put him in a room and kept asking the human, where is the rest of your fleet? And the human wouldn't give up the information and the alien couldn't get it out of him. One day, a beautiful young lady comes in and is incarcerated with him. And this beautiful young lady is said to have been part of another fleet that was against this alien nation and so she was there. They began talking to one another and engaging one another and she began asking him questions about his fleet and he began asking her questions about their fleet and then the alien creature would come in and ask them both about where their fleets were but they weren't giving up any information. Every day they would take the lady outside and uh, bring her back the next day. Over a period of time scales began coming out on the woman and the man said what are they doing to you? What are they doing to you? The woman said, well, they, they're injecting me and they're making me like them. And so they began continuing talking about their fleet. But every day she would get more and more scales on her until one day she was totally scaled and looked just like the creatures that were picking her up every day. Finally, they came to get her and said, we're taking you out permanently. The man looked at her, having exchanged all of his information and said, you have completely changed. She said, no, I've completely changed back. I was always this. I was just made to look like you to get the information. Now that I got the information, I can go back to being who I really am. See, the devil is an angel of light. He wants the information. He wants to pull from you what God has for you. Then he can go back to what he really is. He says the angel has schemes, the schemes of the devil and their design to draw us away from God. But here's the secret that he doesn't want you to know. But I'm going to tell you because God wants you to know it. And I'm going to validate it in just a second. But let me give you a heads up. The only power that Satan and demons have is the power you give them. You're going to discover in just a second they have already been defeated. They've already lost. So they are losers. They have already been defeated. That's not just a song, nor is it just a saying. It is what God declares. But the problem is, well, if they're defeated, how come I'm not winning? Anything they can do, they do because you told them it was okay. You see, you have, that's why they need a body. They need something to loan themselves to them that they can work to and through to express themselves through them. The only power that they have is power that people grant them. The only reason Satan could take over planet Earth is because Adam and Eve gave him permission to do it. They need permission from us to bring hell to us. So if hell is going on in your life, you gave him okay. You told him through sin and circumstance, through yielding to him, it's okay for you to rule my mind. It's okay for you to rule my world. It's okay for you to rule my emotions. It's okay for you to rule my will. I give you permission to tell me I'm not really a man, although I was born a male. I give you permission to tell me I'm not really a woman, although I was born a female. I give you permission to tell me I, I need drugs, want drugs, can't get rid of drugs, can't shake drugs because drugs are what keeps me going. I give you permission to tell me I need that drink, got to have that drink, can't live without that drink. I give you permission to tell me I should wake up depressed, stay depressed, go to bed depressed, wake up the next day depressed, Satan, demons. I give you permission to tell me for the next 10 years of my life, I got to live in misery and depression. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say much of what we call mental illness is really demons being given permission to drive me crazy. I have given demons permission 
some things we call bipolar, these quick moves. Now, sometimes there can be chemical reactions, so I'm not saying the physical is not real, but I am saying a lot of what we call physical chemical reaction is really the result of demonic performance, that the demons have been allowed to roam free, so the chemicals have gone crazy. All right. Now, show me the exceptions to that. And that's another subject. My only point here is until you've addressed the spiritual, you really don't know whether it's just physical. See, we assume it's just physical because it's physical. But if it started in the spiritual and you're only addressing the physical, you'll never get rid of the problem because you've given demons permission to stay at home. And once they're given permission like roaches, they are not going anywhere. Because we have decided to let them live there through their worldview, through the schemes, the deceptive programs of the devil. The devil operates by consent and by cooperation. And some people say, well, 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 some people are just too demon conscious. The problem is most of us are too demon unconscious. He says, oh, we, we wrestle against an unseen world of evil. That's Satan and demons. And you have been assigned one. Some of us got a whole platoon. <laughs> and their job is to keep you from experiencing the will of God for your life. That's their job. That's their full-time occupation. And they are good at it. You're not their first assignment. And neither am I. So... We can't really go further unless you buy that. Everything else I say coming up is going to be wasted information if you don't buy that. That we wrestle not against flesh and blood. If you don't see, if you think people are your problem versus the fruit of your problem, then all you are address are people. If we gave the spiritual world as much a piece of our mind that we give people. Because, you know, we'll give people a piece of our mind in a minute. But if we gave the spiritual world a piece of our mind, as much as we give the physical world a piece of our mind, we'd still have our minds. But we'd have lost our minds because we're giving the wrong thing a piece of it. And when you give so many pieces of it around, you don't have mind left to give. The people are real. The flesh and blood is real. It's just not the root. And so he wants our consent. He needs our consent because his power is based on our consent. That's why he says in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Translation, not your strength or your might. Not your strength. Why can't I get him off my back? Because you've been using your strength. And your human strength doesn't work in that realm. That, that realm, your strength can't work in. That realm can't use your strength. You aren't strong enough for that realm. Now watch this. Please notice what he says over and over. In verse 11, stand firm. The end of verse 13, stand firm. The beginning of verse 14, stand firm firm okay somebody say stand firm stand firm mean don't go nowhere hold what you got stay where you are stand firm means stay in the area that has already brought victory stand firm don't don't go over here over here is lean into your own understanding Okay, don't, don't, don't go over there. Stay in this spot where victory has already been achieved. Don't go to your own victory because you're going to leave the spot. If you're under an umbrella and it's raining, it's raining all around you, but you're not getting wet. If you got a good size umbrella, you're not getting wet, not because rain isn't happening around you, you're just undercover. Because you're undercover, you stay under the umbrella because you don't want to get wet. You stand firm under the umbrella, which doesn't stop it from raining. It just stops it from raining on you. All right? Your standing firm doesn't change the fact that evil is all around you. 
it just keeps evil from raining on you because you are undercover. But the scheme of the devil is to get you to step right or step left with the umbrella over here. So you're no longer undercover. And once you are no longer undercover, they can rain on you. Because you're not undercover. Um, in Western days, a father was uh, out, trying to outrun a prairie fire with his son in a wagon. And they're going real fast, but the prairie fire was going too fast. And they were going to be consumed in a moment. The father, to the confusion of the son, turned the horse around and went to a spot that had already been burned. He said, jump out quickly. They jumped out and he said, now you stay here and don't move. He said, but dad, the fire is coming all around us. It's coming in all directions. He said, boy, stay here. Don't you budge. He said, but dad, I don't understand. There's fire all around us. I, he said, son, I said, stay here. But dad, why are we going to stay here? He says, because this spot has already been burnt. And since this spot has already been burnt, there is nothing left to burn. So if you'll just stay here, the fire may get in the vicinity, but it can't touch us because it's nothing for it to grab hold of. You see, what Satan wants you to do is he wants you to step away from where the fire has already been burnt. Jesus has already been burnt. Jesus has already been crucified. The resurrection has already occurred. He says, stay Stay in that spot. Stand firm in that location. Don't leave the cross because that has already been set on fire. And if you don't leave there, that place can't be burned twice. That's called double jeopardy. What Jesus has accomplished has already happened. So that raises a question, doesn't it? What has he done that I need to stand firm in? Stand firm in the Lord, or he says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, not your determination, power of positive thinking, promises, uh, gritting your teeth, saying I'll never do it again. Oh, that's you. That's just you trying to be a better you. And for a while, you can be a gooder you than you were. But you discover that your strength keeps getting overcome because the evil world can feed off of that because they know your strength is giving them strength. So your strength is only helping them to become stronger. So we actually, helping out the demon world when, they say, when you say, I ain't going to do it no more. They say, I heard that. That's your strength and I get the feet off of you. I get the feet off of you. So we're actually helping the demonic world using our strength. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. So what happened? What happened when Jesus Christ died? Listen to me. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 verse 10, you are complete in him. No additives needed. When you accepted Jesus Christ, Colossians 1, 13 and 15 says, you are transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You are relocated. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 says that Jesus Christ by his death rendered Satan powerless he took the bullets out the gun all he's got now are caps caps make noise they just don't do anything so guess what you and I are being ruled by a cap pistol because it says Jesus has rendered him powerless so he can that's why he can't beat you with power he can only beat you with deception that looks like power if, I, if you hold a gun on me I'm going to be terrified if I hold a gun on you you're going to be terrified until I discover there are no bullets in it that will change how I view you. Now my view of you will greatly change when I discover you have been rendered powerless and you're only looking like you got firepower. It says that he is no longer in control. In fact, Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says that when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead, he conducted a victory parade in heavenly places. He, he went public with it. In the spiritual realm, there was a Macy's parade. And the spiritual realm, the Bible says, paraded the triumph of Jesus Christ, declaring Satan and his demons a defeated foe. In the spiritual realm, there was a parade, a parade many of us, most of us, and maybe all of us have never gone to. We don't know about the parade. 
Jesus Christ declares he has been victory over them so that Ephesians 1.22, 1 Corinthians 15.27 says that everything is now under his feet. That Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ has defeated him once and for all. Therefore, he cannot whip you with power. He must whip you with permission that's been handed to him by us, by our own strength. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. What his power gives, not what your power can conjure up. See, Satan doesn't want you to know that. He does not want you to know that he's already been whipped. Because you're going to treat him different. You're going to look at him different. You're going to talk to him different. See, you're not going to go around saying like Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. Because as long as you grant him that power, he's going to use it. You see, Flip was wrong. devil can't make you do anything. But he can take your permission for him to do it and use it against you. You see? So he doesn't want you to know that. He doesn't want you to know that. You know, I have, uh, I have on TV, as many of you do, the NFL Network, because I love football, and the NFL Network will show you last year's games. They'll show you games from last year. But when they show you last year's game, they'll tell you the score at the beginning of the game. They'll say, let's look at last year when the Dallas Cowboys beat the Houston Texans or let's, let's review the game when, when the Carolina Panthers defeated the New York Jets. They will, they will tell you, they will put the score up. Now, now the game hasn't played yet, but they're letting you know how this is going to wind up. In other words, you start with victory. You know where the victory is. So you're not going to get all shook up when you see a fumble or an interception or a, a, a block or a tackle, you ain't going to get on because you know where this thing is going. You've already discovered in advance where victory lies, which changed your approach to how you view the game. Because you are viewing it from victory, not to determine victory. Stand firm in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. You are not trying to win. He has already won. You are to view your life through the eyes of the victory of Christ, not through the eyes of something you're trying to win. You're, you, see, God has already played this thing in advance, and he's already put it on tape that victory has already been declared, victory has already been won. So when you talk to yourself or when you talk to somebody else, you're not told, if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to be talking as one trying to locate victory. You're supposed to be talking as one who has already declared victory because you are using the Lord's strength, not your strength. Victory is your, but we don't talk like that. We talk like I'm trying to make it. I hope to do better. One day this will pass. I think God doesn't want me here. I hope next year is better than last year. We're talking as people not knowing we have victory, so we talk in uncertainties. We talk in hopefulness. We talk in desire. We do not talk in victory that has been achieved. We quote the verses, but we don't believe the verses we quote. We talk about greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We are more than conquerors in Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. That's religious speech. That's not victory parade. You're supposed to be parading as a victor. Because then Satan knows he can't piggyback off of what you're loaning him. Because if you loan him a stick, he'll beat you over the head with it. He says, I want you to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. He does not want you to come out from underneath the umbrella of God's perspective on a matter. No. Your TV cannot pick up an analog signal anymore. You either have cable or you got a satellite dish if you're watching television. Because you're not getting local channels with an analog signal. That's gone. There will be no picture manifested from the invisible signals through an analog. Because they don't do that anymore. The only way you get a picture is through cable or a satellite. What a lot of us want to do is go to analog, man's point of view, and get our information. Not understanding that don't show up on this screen. You cannot get from the human point of view a divine picture. No wonder things stay blank. 
No wonder I'm not getting clear direction. No wonder I'm not seeing victory in my life because I'm going through a signal God doesn't use. God will not use a signal devoid of his satellite, of his divine perspective. And that's why Satan wants to mess with our minds. We're going to talk about that when we talk on truth. Because guess what your problem is? Between your ears. Everything you need to deal with right now is between your ears. If, if you learn how to deal with what's between your ears, it changes everything. Because he's after the mind. He wants you to think like he wants you to think because then you'll do what he wants you to do. Because it all starts there. We'll talk about that later. But what God wants you to know, you know, there was this uh, movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. If you haven't seen that, next time it comes on, you need to watch that. The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Emily Rose has a demon. And Emily Rose can't get rid of this demon. She calls the priest over to get rid of the demon. The priest tries to get rid of the demon. But the demon won't go anywhere. A trial is held against the priest that's trying to do the exorcism. They call in an expert on demons and exorcism to testify at the trial. The lady sits on the stand and says there most certainly is a demon in Emily Rose. There is a demon that won't go away. And the priest did what he was supposed to do to get rid of the demon that's terrifying Emily Rose. But the reason why the demon won't come out of Emily Rose is that Emily Rose has been medicated with Gamatrol. And Gamatrol dulls the thinking and the mind so that she's not thinking right, so that the demon doesn't have to react to her thoughts because her thoughts have been confused by the addition of the medication. The medication is really locking the demon in. What she has gone to on the human level has kept the demon functioning in her because it's dulled her ability to react to the spiritual impulses that would remove the demon. And since the spirit can't be gotten to because of this intrusion of the medical, it's caused the demon to be trapped inside of her. What many of us have done is gone to man's way of thinking, introduced that way of thinking to us, and wonder why the divine power is not working because the human has trapped the demon in so that the divine can't free the person out. We have introduced alien elements to the spiritual realm so that we're no longer strong in the Lord. We're strong in the Lord mixture. We want to mix the human and the divine and hope that it all works out in the end. He says, be strong in the Lord and I want you to stand firm at communion, Jesus said in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And then he says an interesting phrase. He says, when you take communion and proclaim my death till I come. Now the question is, proclaim your death to who? Well, okay, I'm taking you, I'm eating the bread, I'm drinking the cup. And now you're saying proclaim, proclaim. Proclaim is to speak and to testify. Proclaim my death till you come. So I'm taking communion and I'm supposed to be proclaiming you die to who? To the spiritual realm. That's who. Because the spiritual realm don't want to hear that. Because now you're standing firm. See, when you bring up Jesus Christ to the spiritual realm, when you bring up what he accomplished, Satan, you've been, you've been defeated. And what you're doing to me has already been defeated. You're telling me I got to be on drugs. That's been defeated. You're telling me I have to be gay. That's been defeated. You telling me I have to be immoral? That's been defeated. You telling me I have to be a liar? That's been defeated. You telling me I have to be a drug addict? That's been defeated. You telling me I have to live with anger? That's been defeated. You telling me I have to be depressed day in day out, year in day year out? That's been defeated. And so what you are telling me is a lie. So let me proclaim to you what happened to you on the cross of Jesus Christ, in case you forgot. We don't proclaim his death because we have relegated it to history. Something that happened 2,000 years ago, so we stop standing firm on it. We come up with new tricks of the trade, new gadgets and gimmicks. 
We're trying to find something new. We want to be entertained out of our problems. We want to be fancified out of our problems. We want to, we want to hocus pocus. We want to visit uh, card readers and folk who read your hand. And we want to look at signs in the sky. And we want to find out what the horoscope is and all the time while we're singing Jesus is enough. <laughs> Introducing Gamatrol. Introducing that which traps the demonic inside. And keeps us from being free. So if you're tired, if you are tired of being trapped in that realm, you got to stop using this realm to fix it. Because this realm can't fix that realm. Your point of reference has to be what God has provided. The Bible says in Romans, Satan is now under your feet. He's supposed to be your hostage. You're not supposed to be his. He's not supposed to be running your life, running your emotions, running your passions, running your... He's not supposed to be doing that. If he's doing that, I'm not hating. If he's doing that, you stop standing firm. I've stopped standing firm. We have relocated our position and we're now out in the rain. You say, okay, well, what do I do? What do I do? He tells you, look at what he says. He says, verse 11, put on the full armor of God. He says in verse 13, take up the full armor of God. This is sweet. The armor of God are spiritual resources. In other words, dress for success. Okay? It's all about what you're wearing. It's all about what you're wearing. He says, put on the full armor of God. Okay, so let's get this straight. It's not your armor. It's not your clothes. It's God's clothes. Why? Because God lives in that realm. So he knows what you're supposed to wear. So he wants to tell you how to dress for success. He says, I want you to put on the full armor of God. And when you get dressed for success, what will, what will happen when you get dressed for success? You will be able to handle anything Satan throws at you. You'll be able to handle your temper. You'll be able to handle your addictions. And I'm not saying you won't be tempted. I'm not saying you won't have problems. I'm not saying you won't have fears. I'm not saying you won't have frustrations. I'm saying they won't have the last word. They will no longer be the dictator. They will no longer be the ruler. They will no longer be the controller. They will no longer be the, the emperor of your life. They may show up, but they will no longer have final say-so. No longer have final say-so, but you got to dress for success. Now, we're going to go over six things. There's six things there. Six items of apparel that you've got to wear in that realm if you want that realm to submit to you. He says there's six items. He divides them into three categories. Two categories of three rather. There's six items, the first three and the last three. Notice the difference between the first set and the last set. The first set all begin with the word having. Stand firm, verse 14, having girded your loins. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel. They all begin with have. But the next three don't begin with have. They begin with another verb. Notice it says, take up the shield of faith. Verse 17, Take the helmet of salvation. Take the sword of the spirit. He moves from have to take. Six items, two different categories of three. The first group says have. What does have mean? It's from the verb to be. It means the state of being. It means the first three you wear all the time. You don't take off. They, they're, they're with your 24. It's like your wedding ring or your, a ring you wear that you never take off. He says those you never take off. The last three you pick up as needed. You take them. You have to go get those three, okay? So whenever you need, need the last three, you go get the last three, but you don't take off the first three. So we're going to understand how all six of those work as we go through this. But here's the point I want to make to you now. God gives the armor. He doesn't put them on you. Okay? Watch this now. He tells you to put on the full armor. He Don't say, God, dress me. He will not dress you. He will give you the attire to be dressed in. Okay, how does this work? In grace, God has supplied everything you need. Grace is all that God has already done. God can do nothing new for you. He can do nothing more for you. Because everything he's ever going to do 10 years from now, he's already done. So to even ask God to bless you is kind of a misnomer because Ephesians 1, 3, you have already been blessed with all spiritual blessings, but where are they located? In heavenly places. So let's get this straight. Everything God is ever going to give you, he's already provided it. It's called grace, what God has already provided. That's God's responsibility. 
What's your responsibility and my responsibility is faith. Faith is reaching back to grace and grabbing what grace has provided. Faith is reaching back to the spiritual so that it's made manifest in the physical. God won't do that for you. That's your response to what God has already done. So he says, I will in grace supply the armor. You must in faith put it on. If faith doesn't put on grace, grace won't be beneficial to you. Not because it's not available, it's because you didn't wear it. I could buy you something, pay for it, but if you don't put it on, it's of no use to you, even though it has been completely supplied. So we're asking God for stuff he's already given. We're asking God to do stuff he's already done. We've asking God to accomplish victories he's already provided. But because faith hasn't grabbed it, we haven't gotten it yet. He says, you are going to have to put on the full armor. And when you get through these six pieces, not only will you understand what the armor is, you're going to understand how to strap it up and boot it up put it on so that you can now walk out dressed for success at least permanently dressed in three pieces but have three other pieces nearby in case you need to pick it up and use it at a given moment. He says you must put on the full armor of God. So what I'm trying to tell you maybe is something you've not known before or not known deeply before. Your problems aren't in this realm. They just show up here. The root of your problems are all in the spiritual realm. So if you want to fix what's visible and physical, you've got to address what's invisible and spiritual. But here's what the good news is. When it gets addressed, you will know it's nothing but God. You remember that woman last week? She was, she was sick for 18 years, but the reason she was sick was a demon. The doctors couldn't figure that one out because they were dealing with a physical spinal problem. But she had a spiritual demon that was causing her spine to be bent over for 18 years. But when she stood firm on what Jesus says, it says immediately she was healed. Immediately that thing left her. Let me know when you know it's God. When you've been struggling with it for years and immediately that thing changes. Immediately those taste buds change. Immediately you can turn off that computer. Immediately you can deal with that sin or that struggle or whatever it is. When you know that because you know you're not an immediate kind of person. That's why I've been there for 25 years. Because you're not an immediate kind of solver. But when God shows up and you find out that the, you only needed two of the 12 step program. Because by step two you were delivered. You know that that was a super supernatural invasion of God. You remember his name, don't you? Thomas Anderson. Thomas Anderson is a computer programmer, part-time computer hacker. But one day, Thomas Anderson was introduced to a new realm, a realm called the Matrix. Thomas Anderson was told that behind the physical realm he lived in, was another realm. And he says he found out that this other realm ran his realm with computers. That there were computers and machines in this invisible realm that was dictating the world that he was used to living in. He got transported to this other realm called the Matrix. When he got to this other realm, he discovered some things. He discovered in this other realm he had powers that he didn't have in his normal realm. He discovered in this other realm, his mind could think things that they couldn't think in the realm he came from. He discovered in this new realm called the matrix that there were capacities he never knew he possessed in the realm he had lived in all of his life. He discovered in this new realm, he had a new name. His name was Neo. Because in this new realm, he couldn't use the name from his old realm because the old realm name really didn't define who he really was in his new realm. He discovered in his new realm a new love called Trinity. He discovered in the new realm that there was this lady named Trinity that he fell in love with and had a passionate relationship with in this new realm, a love he had never experienced in his old realm. He discovered in his new realm he was the one. He discovered in this new realm he had a purpose. He had a purpose. He was called to something bigger than just punching computers all day and hacking computers, but there was a significant calling upon his life to have a substantial impact from the invisible realm that would define the visible realm. 
Now, while Neo was over in the new realm, he had a whole new set of clothes. He had this black outfit because the clothes he was wearing in the old realm wasn't going to work for his new assignment in the new realm. He had to dress for success. Now, there were problems in this new realm because there was Satan, Mr. Smith, who had his duplicate demons, Smitty Juniors, and they would all gather to come against Neo, alien, a.k.a. Thomas Anderson, now become Neo, and they would all attack him. But in this new realm, he had the ability to do that. He had the ability to do that. He had the ability to make him and shake him and bake him. Why? Because he had powers in this new realm. He did not possess in the old realm when he discovered that he was more than he was ever used to be because now he's been introduced to a whole nother realm. I'm trying to explain something to you. When you accepted Jesus Christ, he crossed you over to another realm. You got a new name now. You're a son of the living God, a daughter of the living God. You got a new love now. His name is Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In this new realm, Satan will come at you, but God will give you the ability to bounce and dive around. Why? Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm here to tell you, in this new realm, you are the one. Because God has a purpose and a reason and a design for you so that no longer does hell have to control you as long as you operate in the new realm. It's time to cross over. Morpheus came and said, there are two pills. Morpheus said, now if you eat this pill, We'll send you back to your old life, to your ordinary existence, and you can just be a common computer programmer. But he says if you take this pill, then you can now live in this new realm and experience all that this realm has to offer. God is saying to you today, I got a couple pills, which one you want? You want to go back to your old, dull, ordinary, purposeless life? Or you want to take something that will introduce you to a new king and a new kingdom? New power, new identity, new purpose and new glory, new victory and destiny. Which pill do you want? Some of you are going to take the first pill and you're going to go out to your ordinary house and get up out your ordinary bed and go to your ordinary breakfast table and, and, and go to your ordinary car, drive to your ordinary job, work with the ordinary people for the ordinary pay, come back to the ordinary house, look at the ordinary television shows, go back to the ordinary bed, wake up tomorrow the ordinary way. But some people are going to leave here and say, I don't want that life anymore. I want this other pill. I want to go... Out extraordinary, supernatural, heavenly, heavenly places because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I want to go to heavenly places.